Okay, can everyone hear me? So as Chloe mentioned, I was uh, working in the fashion industry before I moved to New Mexico. And fashion is one of those things that people tend to get all in a kerfuffle about whether or not they're doing right. What should I wear? Does this dress make my butt look big? Is this too casual, too formal, too long, too short? Ultimately though, the people who look the best and have the most fun are the ones who have found their own personal style and make it work for them. The answer to any fashion quandary lies in knowing and wearing what works for you and is a unique expression of who you are. So it turns out the same is true of vegetable gardening, which I learned when I made the rather quirky transition from fashion design in Milan to farming in the high desert. When I moved to New Mexico onto 10 terraced acres in Nambe, I had no agricultural experience at all. I had never grown a carrot or dug a potato in my life. On top of that, I grew up in the rainy Pacific Northwest. That's a picture of my mom's garden. And I clearly knew nothing about water scarcity or desert soils. But I wanted to get my hands in the dirt and I was curious. I believed that I could learn whatever it was I needed to know about organic growing. I was convinced at the time that there was some right way to do it. Some tried and true set of instructions that I needed to master in order to farm the right way. So I set to reading as much as I could. The unexpected answer came in a book called Fields of Plenty by Michael Abelman. Abelman chronicles his travels around the country visiting all these different organic farms. And what was, what was so amazing to me at a time when I was nervously trying to find the, the gardening holy grail was the incredible variety of growing and farming styles that existed even under the umbrella of organic farming. It was so refreshing for me and empowering because I saw very clearly that there was no perfect garden, no one singular way to do it. So, but I wanted to start, because it can be a little intimidating, but it's so much fun, I wanted to take you through my process of germinating indoors. So, this is an area where you really have to just find what works for you. There are a million different ways to germinate. You can buy peat pots, plugs, uh, segmented seed trays, heated seed trays. There's, uh, there's so many different doohickeys for doing this. And uh, after much experimentation with a variety of different germination vessels, this is my favorite. It's a daisy sour cream container, small, not large. Or I like also produce clamshells, like the blueberry clamshells. One day I was starting, most people recommend seeding in those big black seed trays. And I was doing this, but I had bought such a gazillion different kinds of seeds that I ran out of black seed trays, so I decided to just improvise with whatever I had in the Tupperware drawer. And what I found was, using my little daisy cup, or yogurt cups or whatever, I was getting a higher germination percentage with the same number of seeds planted in a smaller vessel. So it's sort of like there's this little biological buddy system or something going on where they're like, come on guys, we can do this together because they're closer together and they really seem to germinate better. So that's why I switched to the daisy cup. Um, also the heat and moisture levels are easier to maintain in a smaller container. So I, I start them in a big clump like this and uh, they're a little, little leggy and spindly at first, but that is easily remedied when I transplant them. I just set them a little bit deeper and it's fine. So, so once they've popped and grown a bit, they need to be transplanted to a larger container. And they usually, the time to do this is when it has its first set of true leaves. So true leaves are the first set of leaves that pop up after the cotyledon. So the cotyledons are the little embryonic seeds that are tucked inside the seed casing and they come out first. And then you get your true leaves, which are specific to that species or variety, whereas the cotyledons are the same for plants of a similar um, genus or family. So uh, I don't always wait until this stage, though. I wait until they've gotten a little bit bigger, but it usually ends up being when uh, my thick leaf, the container is bursting at the seams and I need to transplant whenever I can get to it, or if a chicken trying to lay an egg in my house, which does happen, uh, knocks them into the sink, which happened this year. So I, I usually do it whenever I can get to it and they thick, the stem has thickened a little bit and that's really important. So um, most people will transplant to pots at this time. My personal preference though is a soil block and I brought my soil blocker um, 
and it's the most awesome thing. I have some pictures of it too. And it's kind of the only doohickey that I am obsessed with because I basically am a really low maintenance gardener and I use my hands for about everything. But this soil block is so cool because the soil itself becomes the container. So you don't have to deal with all these little plastic pots everywhere, which I hate. Um, I, I, I learned about the soil blocking technique from Elliot Coleman from a book called The New Organic Grower. So he is an incredible farmer and an incredible teacher, but he is a very, very organized anal dude compared to me. So what he actually does is he germinates on this little tiny micro blocker. It makes mini, 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 mini blocks, and he takes a dowel rod and takes each individual seed and places it on each individual uh, mini block. I started off doing that. I was the obedient student, and I wanted to do that. And after about the 20th seed, I wanted to stab myself in the eye with the <laughs> dowel rod. So I took, took what worked for me and left what didn't. I sort of start halfway through. And I hope that you guys all do that today with everything I say, because you really have to find your own method. So let's move on to direct seeding, the stuff that you can seed outside. Another example of how I sort of changed my method, I started off seeding a lot more stuff indoors, even, war even cold weather stuff. I would start it indoors and transplant it because I had read a lot of farmers and, and growers feel like transplanting is the way, of go way to go because it gives the plants a little head start, right? It's like private school. They get, they get extra cush upbringing, so they're going to be ahead of the curve when they go out to face the pests and all the all the struggles outdoors. Well, in my garden, this did not work. In my garden, this ended up being like transferring a spoiled brat little Andover prep student to public high school in the Bronx and expecting them not to get the crap beat out of them. So I actually, I direct seed as much as I can now, other than stuff that absolutely requires it because of the length of our season. So let's start with the dirt, because that's that's what drew me to farming to begin with, wanting to get my hands back in the dirt. I know everyone says this, but it is really true. Healthy soil is literally teeming with life. You have bacteria and fungi, you have worms and insects. Everything's constantly munching and digesting our organics in the soil and making the nutrients available to your plant roots. In healthy natural ecosystems, it's organic matter is constantly being depleted, but it's also constantly being replenished. Animals are dying, plants are dying, things are pooping, leaves are falling. It's always getting replenished. So the idea is we want to mimic this natural process and even improve upon it, especially if you already have soils that are a little bit subpar. So when I started growing, my mantra was organic farming is all about the poo because we had an omnipresent pile of aged chicken manure in our, in our driveway. This is actually literally in the middle of the driveway. We have to drive around it. But um, manure is a great way to increase soil organic matter and provide a fairly a quick source of nutrients also for your plants. So we use chicken a lot because it's high in, um, particularly high in nitrogen. And there's great places where you can purchase stuff if you have a neighbor or a friend with uh, horses or goats. Ask them if they will can give you some of their aged manure that's been turned. Another thing you could do for uh, straight organic matter is to plant cover crops, great nitrogen fixing cover crops like alfalfa, clover, peas, different things like that, and then turn it into the soil. That's called a green manure. That's a great source of nitrogen. Um, so the other option, this is, looks very similar, but um, bigger than my car, is a pile of really great compost. And compost is another form of, nitri of adding organic matter back, but it's a little bit further along, so the forms are a little bit more stable. Um, and it actually can have substances that have been emitted by those little microorganisms that are great, that actually encourage plant growth. But moving on to another way to deal with our um, soil issues here. When I first started, I had read a book called um, Growing Food in the High Desert Country, which is a really sweet little book. And it talked about raised bed gardening as one way of improving the productivity of our compacted soils. So this is me on our first year, that, that first picture. This is that, these are those beds. Um, and this is 
our first uh, go at raised beds, and I'm adding something here, it's called Earth Magic, which is a local product that's great for enlivening dead soils. But um, this is taken a little bit later the same year. So I love raised beds, and I continue to use them for basically all of our growing. Now, I've heard some authors, some books I've read advocate a no-dig method. They think that this is even too invasive, that you should just let surface compost and let the worms do all the work of aerating your soil and bringing the organic matter deeper into the soil. And I was really bummed out, and I felt like a real thug when I read this book. Then I found out the guy was from England, <laughs> and I don't think that people from England understand the particular woes of a desert farmer. So if you think that you have really rich, undisturbed soils, then you can surface compost, and you don't have to worry about doing this double digging process, because some people think it, it disrupts the soil profiles. I don't think that, because you, don't, you leave that first foot on the top foot and add the organic matter there, and then you loosen the second foot, so you're not inverting layers. So, I have had great luck with raised bed gardening, and we do all of our growing in it. Um, also because we have pretty high demand at the restaurant and a, and a relatively small space, so you can be amazingly productive with these beds. And one of the things I love about raised beds is they really help with water management, and they work really great in concert with drip lines. So the flattened table of the raised bed is perfect, as opposed to like a sloped row, is perfect for capturing water, and you can just fit it with drip tape. And I, we have all sorts of drip lines at the restaurant in our landscaping stuff, and it is a pain in the booty. It is always coming off, and the little infiltrators, it's great, but it's, it's, it's much more high maintenance. This is really easy. You just take the tape, you stake it down. It's not as high maintenance as landscaping installations, in my opinion. So um, you've increased that porosity, so once you're dripping, you're going to cap, the plant roots are actually going to capture that. So with drip irrigation, a higher percentage of the water you start with is actually going to make it to your plant. We have chickens wandering all over the property, and they really helped with our grasshopper problem. We really did have a biblical scale grasshopper problem. Like they would part as the, like the seas. Um, so sometimes the chickens dig up a few seedlings or you know eat a couple tomato fruits, but in general, it's far worth it, and they've just they've created a more diverse ecosystem there. So obviously, if you can't have chickens in your backyard, which I so recommend, but if you can't, um, get bird, get bird feeders and try to attract birds. Um, whatever you can do um, to ma maintain a healthy, varied food web at all different levels um, will help you keep the herbivorous pests in check. Um, providing Organic matter and responsible irrigation to the soil supports the base of the food chain by nourishing the microorganisms. Worms and other insects feed on the microorganisms. Frogs and birds feed on the worms and insects. And then you get snakes, eagles, owls, pigs, goats, whatever you can do in your particular space to, to encourage a variety of species in your garden and its surroundings is ultimately going to stabilize the system as a whole. And that's, that's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah.